Sometimes labels stick. Labels, nicknames that characterize a person, place, or thing and stops the non-critical thinker in their tracks and they just run with the label and never consider anything different than that label. In other words, sometimes stereotypes stick and those of us who believe in the stereotype lose out on whatever limits the stereotype places on not only the person being stereotyped, but also the limits that puts on those of us who believe the stereotype. Thomas was labeled from one encounter with the risen Christ, and he was stereotyped through the giving of a nickname. Who knows the nickname? Doubting Thomas. If we don't know anything else, probably everybody in here knows about Doubting Thomas. Well, today I'm here to redeem Thomas and any other person who has questions about our faith. Thomas did absolutely nothing wrong and perhaps everything right. Here we are at the first Sunday following the resurrection. We've learned a bit about crucifixion. Some of us, from the time of our coming to the faith, we've actually learned a bit about the crucifix. That's the cross. Some of us wear crosses as symbols of our faith right around our necks and have not given really much thought to what it actually is. I'll never forget, and we were blessed last week by the Reverend Dr. Brad Braxton, my mentor and friend, and, and I'll never forget being in his class as his teaching assistant was just a special, a special place to be. I didn't have to do his papers, but I got to talk to him about everything. And I'll never forget when he called the cross what it is, a crucifix, and named it as a tool of capital punishment, sometimes for those who came against the empire and students who had them around their necks in that class didn't know whether to keep them on or take them off. What do I do with this, this crucifix around my neck? Most importantly that day, Dr. Braxton made us think. Somebody say think. Think about that which many of us had been religiously doing all of our lives without much thought. Yes, we believe that the cross was a symbol that Jesus died for our sins, but what did that even mean and was it the truth? We read, and, and as thank you for reading what is becoming, as you probably know, one of my favorite scriptures, the Proverbs text, in all thy getting, it must be the thing for this year, in my spirit, get an understanding. That when taken at face value, the cross was a form of execution, hear it again, for public shame and fear so that no one continued the movement that he started, that this was the point, the goal of Jesus' crucifixion. You've heard it, but hear it again. I hope you're not bothered that I keep naming this because for centuries, actually nearly two millennia, it's simply been a sign of Jesus' love and forgiveness. Allow me the freedom for just a few Sundays and a few years maybe to, to offer a bit more about that, which is the symbol of our faith that hangs around our necks and on some of our stoles is a crucifix. It's, it's a, a, a tool for capital punishment. The crucifixion of Jesus was an attempt to stop his movement of love and justice and a movement to resist and overcome the power of the empire over people. It's meaningful in that context and in our context. For the crucifixion didn't accomplish what it was intended to accomplish. Jesus indeed did rise from the crucifixion, yet the mission to stop the movement has never ended. 
The mission to stop the Jesus movement of justice and love and people over empire has never ended and it was quite fragile and most vulnerable right after the crucifixion. And so our scripture today takes us to the evening on that first Easter Sunday and the future of the movement is hanging in the balance. Verse 19 says, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, this is Easter, the day that Jesus rose and, and Mary Magdalene and went to the tomb and, and could not find his body. And the disciples at this point in the story are locked in a room and afraid. Afraid because they believe that those who crucified Jesus were looking for his posse now and planning to further do away with them to really stop the movement. So they're locked away in the room and the text says Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. It's meaningful to me in this very moment in my life that Jesus began with a blessing of peace. Peace be with you. Jesus not only understands that the future of his movement hangs in the balance, he also understands trauma. Jesus understands that at this very moment the disciples are traumatized by what they just experienced. Anyone would be. And they can't carry on being disciples, followers, carrying on the movement of one who was hanging on the cross. They can't carry on the movement of justice and peace and people over empire if they themselves have no peace. So he's intentional. He comes to them. And the first thing he offers them is peace. And Jesus' disciples today also are vulnerable to trauma. Some of us are trying to do the work of Christ, but we have trauma. So I'm so grateful that people are coming to understand more about trauma. Seminaries are studying and teaching about trauma. Seeking therapy is more common among clergy because some of us understand what it means to be traumatized and how it impacts our ability to carry on doing what God has called us to do. So I encourage us all, clergy and lay alike, to understand that Jesus and his first encounter with the disciples after the horrific crucifixion offered the disciples peace. Not just because it was a nice salutation, but because he understood that at that moment they were beyond troubled. They were horrified and peace was exactly what they needed in that moment. And peace is exactly what some of us need. If I'm by myself, I'll be by myself in this moment. We need peace. Individually and collectively, there's so much going on. Dr. J named some of it. For those of us seeking to do the work, work outside of ourselves to help somebody else, hear the Lord saying to you, peace be with you. The Gospels tell us that even the winds and the waves obey the Lord. So if you need peace today, hear the Lord saying your name and saying peace be with you. For the movement hangs in the balance. Jesus enters the room and offers them peace. Then verse 20 says, after he said this, he showed them his hands, showed them his sides. Then the disciples, it says, then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. The movement hangs in the balance and the disciples are terrified and traumatized. Jesus enters where they are, offers them peace. Then he offered them a visual manifestation that he was indeed the risen Christ. And the Bible says then 
the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord and the movement has a chance to go on. For it is at that point that verse 21 says Jesus said to them again, he knew the trauma wasn't gone that fast, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. This is one representation of the Great Commission. As the Father has sent me, we're going to remember that. So I send you. They are just now beginning to pull it together. And in the height of this experience with Jesus, he gives it purpose. He says, I send you as I was sent. Verse 22, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. I don't know, it might be the scientist in me, the engineer in me, but I see a formula here for helping followers continue a movement after they've been traumatized. But nobody is smarter than God, Ingrid always reminds me, so, so I only see what the good Lord put there. And here it is, peace and a manifestation of the divine are the beginning of a process of restoration of spiritual wellness and faith to be followed by the commission and the impartation of power Anybody writing the formula down? <laughs> Yielding empowered disciples who will continue the movement. You can watch the tape and get it later. <laughs> it's just the first evening and the disciples are surely still bewildered, yet they are becoming becoming, becoming empowered disciples who will continue the movement. Why? Our very presence is proof that the, the movement continued, but they needed a process to work through that trauma so that they could continue. And it continued because the risen Christ granted them peace. He granted them a visual manifestation that he is indeed their friend and Lord who they deserted when he was crucified. Yet he is manifesting himself to them in a way that begins to restore their spiritual wellness and their faith. He gives the commission. He imparts power, breathes on them the Holy Spirit. He doesn't wait for Pentecost, according to John. He does it right then and there, and they feel their help coming. And better than they were at the beginning of the scene. What's described in a paragraph can take a lifetime, and that's okay. It's a process of building a spiritual life in Christ. For there is one person, but excuse me, but there's one person missing from this spiritual wellness retreat, Dr. J. There's one person missing, and that's Thomas. Thomas is missing from this retreat with Jesus. You know him as doubting Thomas, but I'm here to redeem Thomas today. Verse 24 says, but Thomas, who was called a twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Thomas has not asked for one thing that the other disciples didn't already have. Early in the morning in John 20, Mary Magdalene, and I'm calling her a disciple too, she, she saw Jesus in the garden, and not only did she get to see Jesus, he called her by name. Manifestation. In the story as told by Matthew, 
In Matthew 28, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary both got to see and talk to Jesus in the garden near the tomb. Manifestation. And in our text today, all the other disciples but Thomas get to see Jesus. And verse 20 says, Jesus showed them his hands and his side. Manifestation. So why is it such a sin? that Thomas asked for the very thing all the other named disciples got to have. Thomas only asked for what they had without asking. And the fact that he asked for what he needed shows that he's honest. So instead of doubting Thomas, I want to suggest that we call him Honest Thomas. Say that with me, Honest Thomas. All right, put it in the news tomorrow. Hyde Park Union Church renamed Thomas Honest Thomas. And that's why I say the faith needs more Thomases. You see, there's a movement hanging in the balance, a movement of love, justice, and people over empire. It's not a game. It's not a religion, at least that's not what Jesus set out to establish. Jesus was establishing thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. As it is in heaven, a movement where God's love and justice reigns and where people are not oppressed by empire. And Thomas, one of the twelve, was important enough to Jesus and Jesus important enough to Thomas that Thomas was honest about what he needed. And Jesus met him at his point of need. And Jesus, the divine, will meet you at your point of need. For the text says in verse 26, a week, that's like today, a week from Easter, later his disciples were again in the house. And Thomas was with them this time. I guess he figured I better start hanging with the brothers a little closer. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Do you hear that devotion? Thomas's words, my Lord and my God, that's the kind of devotion that inspires a movement. But let me ask a question first. Why has religion made it a sin to be a critical thinker? Why has faith been defined as believing with no manifestation at all? Why has the proof of one's faith been defined as never asking questions? Never asking for what you need. When I entered seminary in 2008 at McCormick, I entered with 55 other incoming students. And we all, I remember it like it was yesterday, we all sighed a sigh of relief when during orientation they said we could finally, somebody say finally, we could finally ask our questions. What questions? The questions we have been holding in our entire Christian lives. That we were made to believe that if we asked them, shame on us. And what saddens me is that entering seminary classes today don't get anywhere near 56 students. Like my entering class. Y'all know I did admissions for seven years and it wasn't my fault, but those numbers kept dropping and they are still dropping. Seminar, seminaries are happy if they get 20. And that's a big class these days at the master's level. What is happening to the curiosity 
the willingness to study. Dr. Evans, I hear you. What is happening to the willingness to engage in scholarship about the faith? What's happening to answering the call to justice, to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly, to call the call to go and make disciples? Teaching them, Jesus said, teaching them everything that I've taught you. Religion does not welcome questions, but ironically, faith does. Think about that for a little while. And when you ask questions, get ready for the most fascinating conversation in your life. For there's ultimately a movement hanging in the balance and Jesus is not going to allow the movement to fail because some simple questions. Especially because he's got absolutely nothing to hide. And here's what I love about Jesus. Jesus gave Thomas exactly what he asked for. Thomas said, unless I see the mark of nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Jesus, apparently overhearing that conversation, Jesus hears us. He wasn't in the room, but when he came in the next room a week later, he said, Thomas, Put your hands right here and put your, put your hand right here. Do not doubt, believe. Thomas says, my Lord, my God, and I am telling you today, ask for what you need to strengthen your faith and you will be blessed. But don't believe me, believe Jesus. Verse 29, Jesus said, hey, have you believed because you have seen me blessed? Somebody say blessed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. And we are indeed blessed. We might not be able to see Jesus in the flesh walk through that door, but we don't have to hide our questions either. Jesus called us blessed, and it's not a blessing to feel like you can't ask a burning question. That's not blessed. It's not blessed to tuck something away and go through the motions because it feels inappropriate. That's not blessed. It's not blessed. It doesn't inspire devotion. When you, like, really don't believe, but hey, I'll go along with everybody else. That's not blessed. Jesus said we're blessed, and it's not a blessing to fake like you believe when you're really unsure. That does not inspire a movement. Jesus called us blessed, and here's how I believe we're blessed. We're blessed with the Gospels and with biblical stories of healing and transformation and victory over injustice and miracles. We're blessed with the study of the languages, Hebrew and Greek. Students don't feel blessed when they're going through it. I know that, but it's a blessing to study the sacred text in the original languages, so scholars, and that could be you or me, scholars don't have to be way up here, but we can dive even deeper into the sacred text, whether it's in the canon or not. We're blessed with theological education instruction. We're blessed with preachers and teachers. It was Paul in Romans 10, 14, who says, how then can they call on the one whom they have believed, and how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard, and how can they hear without a preacher, and, and how can anyone preach unless they be sent? So we're blessed by the preachers in our lives who were sent to preach and not convict you when you ask questions. We're blessed with Bible study, which we must resume. Amen, lights. We're blessed with friends and colleagues to talk and wrestle with the text. Dr. Brad used to, used to call it tackle football. He would say some outlandish things. Students would get up and leave the class. He said, I don't know why they're leaving. All they got to do is come back at it. What you got? Bring it to the table. Let's talk. Let's reason together. We're blessed with a Jesus who said, ask. 
and it shall be given to you. And see, our capitalistic mind means that me, thinks that means asking for stuff. Jesus said, ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find and knock, and the door will be open. We're blessed with the divine who will manifest divinity to us. As a matter of fact, the divine does it absolutely every day. If we would just open our eyes to the beauty of all creation, not just the beauty, but the majesty, the numbers of creatures we have no idea exist. My, my, uh, my president of Faith in Place, Brian Souter, just came off sabbatical and he told me that he went diving with some theologian divers who study the underwater and the, the creatures underwater. Just fascinating. We're blessed. I hope you see we're blessed. We're blessed with the ability to think, to remember, to ask questions and to seek answers. We're blessed with a Jesus who gave us the greatest commandment. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your, anybody, mind. He didn't say, check your mind at the door. The ushers will give it back to you on your way out. That's not what he said. He said, love me with that mind that is so brilliant and magnificent. You don't have to check it to be a person of faith. We're blessed by the fact that Jesus had no problem offering the disciples the manifestations they needed to carry on. Verse 30, the writer of the Gospel of John tells us, now Jesus did many other signs. Now if Jesus didn't feel like the disciples needed signs, why did he give them more and more and more before he ascended? It says they're not even written in this book. He continued to give them what they needed to do the work he called them to do, and that's what he'll do for you and for me. Remove, remember, there's a movement, not a religion. There's a movement hanging in the balance, and there's a side that wants that movement to finally give up. And to label a disciple who did not get what all the others got an experience with the risen Christ, to label him a doubter just because he was honest and wanted to see Jesus himself, to label him doubting Thomas so that any Christian with questions would feel ashamed to have questions, ashamed for trying to love the Lord their God with their whole mind. That sounds like a great way to stop a movement. Tell people, don't ask any questions. But I say to you that the faith needs more Thomases. Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be open. And all thy getting, get an understanding. And be blessed. God bless you, honest Thomas. Amen. <laughs>